<laughs> I always okay. Say. Yes. So thank you very much. <laughs> now we have to look prettier, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so anyway, everybody, thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Um, again, apologies for the time that suddenly changed. I was totally unaware when I arranged all this that it's going to be summertime in Belgium. I realized it last Friday, I guess, by looking at a news article about this discussion every time we have summertime, winter time. And um, as we had this planned for eight o'clock Japan time was the best for us to stick with it. We have to finish in one hour because Dr. Morisato has to leave. My apologies that I mixed up the time. Um, if you have any questions, we have a chat box. So please feel free to uh, add questions in the chat box. If and when there's time, of course, we will um, try to go through the questions and answers then later on in the evening. So first of all, maybe you can give a short self introduction uh, your background, maybe where you're from in Japan. I didn't even ask probably <laughs> in our introduction. Sure. I leave the floor so, to you for the first. Okay, so thank you so much for this uh, fantastic invitation. It's great to be a part of the KU Lerm alumni. And this is the first case where I'm talking about my background to um, audience in Japan. <laughs> it's usually the other way around. I'm in Japan and I'm talking to the audience. Uh, because of the pandemic, um, the world is upside down indeed, and uh, this is a situation. Now, I, I, I'm a specialist of Japanese philosophy, so that's the first thing that, to keep in mind that I, I worked in, in, in the history of philosophy, uh, but then I specialize in Japanese comparative and Japanese, so including East Asian philosophy as well. And so that's the in the background. Where should I start talking? Like, where I'm from, from uh, Japan? I'm I, actually, this is a little bit of a complicated life story, but I was born in Mexico. My parents uh, work for uh, Santori, um, the company that sells whiskey and beer. And um, so they used to have Mexico City brunch. I, they might still do right now. But my father spoke Spanish, so they shipped him to Mexico City for seven years, and I was there for five years. And then we moved back to Tokyo, and my parents are from Kansai, so Kyoto, Osaka. So I grew up in a Kansai family, but I mostly grew up in Tokyo. Uh, first in Setagaya, and then uh, second half in uh, Nishitokyo, so Kogane, Koganeshi, uh, closer to the Tokyo Chiro Line, uh, Kokobunji Station is the closest station uh, there. And when I was 20 years old, I was the first year in uh, Japanese college. Uh, I was a freshman at the Saitama University. <clears throat> and um, I was really getting bored um, in the first year in college. So you pass the entrance exam in Japan and everybody sort of parties and you don't really study for the first few years. And I was just thinking, um, what should I do with my um, academic career or just studying? So I sort of quit and I went to the United States. That's why I speak with the Nebraska and uh, a little bit of a Trump supporter accent. <laughs> it's like the 70% it's the supporter of Trump is from the state of Nebraska. Anyway, so I went there for a bachelor's degree and studied history of philosophy and then went to Los Angeles to do the master's degree. And I went back to this University of Nebraska. Um, how dare you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so I went back to the Nebraska to teach philosophy as a full-time teacher, full-time lecturer at the University of Nebraska, my alma mater. And um, I was wondering what should I do with my life, basically. You know, I'm a philosopher, so I have to wonder all the time. Then I met this professor from KU Live, and he's an Irish professor, uh, Professor William Desmond, who received the emeritus, I became an emeritus professor a few years ago from philosophy department. And I met him in Philadelphia and Texas, and he remembered me from the audience two times. And I said, what are you doing after this teaching? And I said, oh, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do. They said, you should get a PhD. And I teach in KU Live in Belgium. So you should uh, come over. So I just sort of decided that's what I'm going to do. Um, now, KU Live and philosophy programs used to, maybe they still do this, this amazing pamphlet that every philosophy department you go in the United States, you see this one giant pamphlet of names of famous scholars. And it's like a myth back in the days. This is the United States. So it's like 
it's open admission. So if you meet the minimum requirement, you would enter. And also it was free education, you know, and, and that was a kind of like a myth, in the United States. It's like, that's not possible. <laughs> right? So it's just, I remember this distinct pamphlet and I'm having a conversation with a professor from Caleb and, oh, you should come to Belgium. Uh, so that's how I ended up coming to uh, Belgium. And my partner is Belgian. She's uh, Flemish. Uh, she's from Turnhout. So, you know, uh, that's one of the reasons why I, um, I actually, so to fast forward, after finished PhD, I started the work in Japan two years, and then came back to University of Liberty de Bruxelles for two years postdoc, and then I had a research fellow position for five-year contract at the uh, Sun Yat-sen University in China. Uh, it's a famous university in southern China, and I was working there first year, and then I was thinking maybe we have to think about like moving to China, but I go there first and set things up because things are quite complicated. And I was there and then visited her in the Chinese New Year, New Year's Eve in January or February, 2019. That's when Wuhan happened. So the flights to China all canceled. And then after that, Europe follows suit, right? And so basically I was just staying in her hometown for a year and then you know, just first year I was working for Chinese university online, but it was not sustainable position unless you actually go back and it was not thinkable for me to go back. So I just, you know, what? I'm just going to stay in Belgium, stay put, uh, look for opportunities that are um, closer to my specialization. And then Jethro Brussels office hired me. Um, and then I also work for a Japanese sake company that they imports and sells Japanese sake in, in Benelux region and beyond. They needed to somebody who can actually read the labels and also explain where it comes from. And so it requires quite a bit of knowledge of history and, and, and politics and uh, geopolitics of Japan. Um, so that's what I've been doing. And uh, Professor uh, Vanovic, um, you know, I approached him as a listen, I, I'm a specialist of Japanese philosophy. Um, I'm looking for some university affiliations that I can put on my text when I publish uh, these books. And I said, you're more than welcome to join us. So before he moved to University of Tokyo, he put me on the list. Um, so I maintain Japanese philosophy work. And this is additional information that happened last like a month ago. Um, I'm actually becoming full-time lecturer, um, professor of Japanese philosophy at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland from this August. So I'll continue working with the KU Leuven, but I'll be um, uh, teaching Japanese philosophy in academic context 100% uh, while carrying all the information and connections from uh, Jethro and um, Japanese sake industry. So that's condensed <laughs> you can pick any parts of it and it's going to be more than longer than one hour yes <laughs> so, you know, yeah. very very interesting indeed and, and very varied like you just say but let's why what i suggest is that we go through these very short questions you yeah. answer with a yes or no or whatever i ask i think i send them to you and then we go deeper into some parts of of what you're at this moment doing all right so what is your favorite belgian food Favorite Belgian food. I mean, there's so many cliches, right? Like everybody goes for uh, fritz and chocolate, right? I'm, and okay, <laughs> like a Flemish or francophone. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're. It Belgian. doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. No, no, it doesn't matter. Okay, let's say. Okay, I'm gonna think about this, but the first place that I take people, so I said, okay, right. I wanna eat some Belgian food tonight. Like when visitors come to Belgium and I take the first place, is actually a stoveless. Uh, uh, but it has to be stoveless with the Chimay Blue or higher, like higher choice of beer. And there are a few places in, in, in Belgium that I, I mean, it's a different region, it's a different, um, you know, specialization, but I think that's one of the, like, yeah, it's a Belgian food. Um, 
another thing that I like is um, Brussels sprouts and Whitloaf. Oh. Uh, we don't really eat Brussels sprouts and Whitloaf in Japan. Uh, Whitloaf sometimes, you know, Belgian home cooking, they use like a brandy to make it bittersweet. Uh, Brussels sprouts, if you go to the city of Tokyo and try to buy Brussels sprouts, I think it's like a hundred yen per sprout. <laughs> so it's like three, like three euro for four sprouts. So it's, uh, it's it, that's one of the things that I really like eating in Belgium. Wow. It's in, I'm just very, very quickly on the Chimé Bleu uh, stove please, because in my region, they mostly use like a Rodenbach and I just heard somebody use the Creek beer. But we have yeah. a few weekends here in Japan, and their stove is made with Chimé Bleu, which I heard for the first time. So since then, I've been yeah, using yeah. Chimé Bleu too. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Rodenbach sounds nice, though. Yes. The Rodenbach sounds nice. Creek, I'm not so sure. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. but, it's a, but it's the fine distinctions that are, I think if you know Belgian beer, you'll be able to tell differences. And I think that's the, uh, that's the thing that I really like. But it takes four or five hours to cook one. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to do it. Uh, so it's, it's very, yeah, time-consuming cooking. Yeah. yeah. So what is your favorite Belgian beer then? If you have one, maybe many more, but... Yeah. <laughs> so... Too much to choose from. It, at the PhD in, in, in philosophy in KU Leuven, you probably drank more beer than reading books. <laughs> and also like you go encyclopedic as much as possible um so of course everybody has to say west flatten is the best it's a 17 years of champion and if you drink that you know this is like like the reason why belgium is famous for this beer but there are few that are very very rare um that i really like uh, for since you mentioned rodenberg like sour ale we don't really see sour ale outside of Belgium. And one of them is called the Duchesse de Bourgogne. One of the best sour ale that I've ever tasted from Belgium. Um, and another one since, um, um, how, how do you pronounce it, Giles? That's how you pronounce your name? Uh, Giles? Ah, Giles. Giles. <laughs> Giles, okay. Um, because of your background in, in La Duza Plain, I, I'm going to mention this place. It's in the faculty bar by philosophy department has the M Museum. And yeah. mm. M Museum has like M Cafe. So the cafe built into the museum. They have this tap for um, Alpeide. Um, I'll spell it, spell it for you. Uh, I have never, I don't know if I've heard it. Maybe it's a pills or is it? Yeah, a, I, even I, local Belgians don't like, know. Yeah, so I'll pay it brown. This one is as good as a West Flatteran, but it's really cheap. So it's like it's it's a regular <laughs> glass, you know, price price, and then the level is astonishing. So, okay. um, but you have to go to Leuven or Food Garden, I think, to get it. I don't. I've never seen it outside of um, Leuven before. So and specific places in Leuven that have tap even. Yeah, well, so those are the my great. favorite ones. Uh, I mean, it's a new beer. If I have to keep it short. You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> then, of course, our Belgium frites, the fries with mayonnaise yeah. or with ketchup, or you have another samurai sauce. Let's say I don't know people. Yeah, I think it's disgusting if you come from a ketchup culture to go into mayonnaise, <laughs> and it's true. But I think at some point you have to try the restaurant grade mayonnaise. Uh, Fritz. So it's it's a little bit of both, you know. And I don't know. You've been to free tour place lately, but the number of sauces I think increased <laughs> over the last like ten years. Like I remember when I came here, it was just mayonnaise. That's it. But then from the third year onwards, you start the cocktail sauce, samurai sauce, and then recently I went to uh, one in Brussels because uh, this Singaporean students wanted to meet these so but we went to the one famous one and they had like 20 different sauces so maybe half of them are mayonnaise based more than half of them yeah so like i think we have to get rid of this idea of mayonnaise that come from <laughs> qp you know <laughs> just the one specific kind of mayonnaise and i think um you know so like i would say mayonnaise but with 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 the qualifications all right yeah. 
And then do you have, I don't know, maybe, you know, your, your, your partner is Flemish speaking, you're still well, teaching and studying in Leuven, it's a Flemish port. What, you have a favorite Flemish Dutch word that you've learned or that you, I don't know how, if you understand a little bit or not at all. Famous, famous? Favorite. Uh, the favorite, yeah. favorite or a favorite. Flemish word. Wow, okay, that's a really difficult one. What's your favorite Flemish word? And then maybe it would have sparked my. Uh, oh, do God. you have any favorite? Oh no, uh, <laughs> we were we always <laughs> discussed like because we have different you know dialects as well from where we are. So we were discussing uh -huh. on the on the boat. What is this? Apple, apple, blue. It's a color. Oh, it's the name favorite. of a color, but it's really interesting because it's not yeah. blue and it's not green, but the. Yeah. The link is it's apple blue and sea green. The translation is, but, but okay. apples are green and sea. The sea is blue, right? Yeah. So it's really nice because it's in between green and blue. It's like peacock. So that's yeah. like such a nice word because it you, mm. it it shows the interconnectedness between green and blue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So the color, color. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't think about any color, but the, the, oh. there has to be something specific. Um. <laughs> Right, the, the Flemish culture that I, um, it's not a it's not a word, but I like the Flemish expression. When you ask the questions about yes and no, there's always in between, and they go like this. <laughs> you know, their their mouth kind of gets smaller, and then just hey, bubbles to left or right, and you know if you push hard, you can get through it. <laughs> I think that's the most most favorite favorite. Uh, but you know, I think the, the most common word that I struggle in the beginning was is probably hezelic. Uh, so cozy. Translation yeah, cozy. It was very difficult for me to understand. Uh, but now I do. Like I now understand, okay, that's what you're going for. It has to be, yeah, it has to be comfortable. It has to be cozy. Right. Okay. Uh, so maybe that's the word. Thank what you. is this sentence? So I can pronounce it Jill because we're from the same dialect, but you can explain it. So <laughs> I'll is that, that which that. dialect is this? It's the yeah, so the, yeah, it's West Flemish. very like yeah. typical West Flemish. Um mm -hmm. and it, it's it kind of comes from this typical farmer culture of like no matter how tough it is, you just keep going. So you just keep going. Yeah, that's the literal wow. translation there. All type life, okay. Just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a, almost like Japanese, but I do notice like the West Flams are hardworking. Like they <laughs> present themselves as that, that's very the stereotype. <laughs> yeah, stereotype. Like you, you, you like Monday, eight o'clock, you're still working. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I see, I see. Expressions. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. So, well, we, we heard uh, briefly about your background and how you ended up in Leuven. So it was introduction by a professor at the time. Um, mm -hmm. What was your biggest challenges studying and studying in Leuven and living probably in Leuven or a different place? I don't know. But uh, what was your biggest challenge there? I think several different challenges. First of all, like the student culture in general, uh, I think it's in general Belgian culture of the student populations, they tend to go home during the weekends, right? So the living during Monday to Thursday is different from living from Friday to Monday. It's completely different environment. And I think we had enough international students around to you know, create our own community but the town becomes incredibly desolate. Like everybody moves out on Thursday and come back on uh, Monday or Tuesday. I think that's very difficult for international students. Um, it, it, the, the problem is like, you, you say, hey, how was your weekend? Like, oh, it's good, you know? And then you start to become friends and then you go out on Thursday and Friday, uh, uh, Wednesday or Thursday, and you become best buddies. Once they go home, the Belgian students, like the, the whole narrative, gets canceled instead of carry over to the next so i think that was the one of the most difficult part of like making local flemish friends um you know but international uh body the student body was huge to the point i i, I think it was not 
as much of a problem, but I did feel a little bit of differences between Flemish students taking classes in, in, in Flemish and then international students taking classes in international. And then so it's not a friction, but it's just the two different worlds. And I didn't feel that there was uh, enough interactions. Um, yeah, and I think like probably the last five years, things have changed quite a bit, but the philosophy department, for instance, there was almost zero gender and equality and cultural diversity either. So it was, it's very strange to be surrounded by internationals that are incredibly diverse and working at like studying at the university that was not there yet, right? So, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure it's changed last, uh, since I'm done like six years ago, I finished and, um, you know, I'm pretty sure things are moving rapidly in a different direction right now, but that was the, um, time, but also education was free, so no complaints. <laughs> it's like the golden, you can stay as long as you want, no tuition fees, you know, so it's like the complaints never become to the point of, uh, um, yeah, it's just, it, it, we just lived in a golden age where we could study philosophy for free. Yeah, but it's true that, you know, with the, we don't, as a student, you know, we don't really realize that, I guess, that, you know, we go home for the weekend, you know, we have laundry to do, yeah. or, you know, mommy has laundry to do and then cooking for yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. But it's true that in that case, indeed, you are less connected with, with the students over the weekend when everybody has free time. And I think yeah. in Britain too, there's this huge division between locals, local people, local living mm -hmm. there, nothing to do with university, and then the students, of course. And I yeah. think for us, when we study in Japan, that's probably what we, well, I did try to do, like, you know, staying away from the international students, but go, hang out with Japanese students or yeah, yeah. people to learn more Japanese, of course. So actually yeah. that's, yeah, I hope it's changing. Um, and that's also mm -hmm. many more people probably live in Leuven now. I don't know if they go home that frequent uh, in the weekends, but um, yeah. And, uh, what was the second point? I, I, I also think like uh, Leuven is really student town. Mm -hmm. So when the students of like, you know, I started my PhD 26 years old, 27, uh, that's MPhil, so like maybe 28 when I started my PhD, end of 20. So it's different like age group, right? Like the older bachelor's students are just coming out from high school and just going to university, they have to go home. And then older students, I think my recommendation is like maybe move out of living, like live different town and then commute even. And I think that gives you a little bit more like enjoyment of studying at living instead of just staying live and whole time and go back and forth between your coat to library, just live in an apartment somewhere in Antwerp and then <laughs> come down to living. No, I think I seriously, this is my recommendation to uh, incoming older students, yeah. Yeah, I think, but I think in my case, I had like a totally different life, if you know, like weekend life and then student life. And that was probably, I don't know, maybe I was an ex exception, but uh, yeah. I understand yeah. it's, it's, it's true. Um, yeah. And then of course, free education, that's what we also promote that of course, well, free or it's, mm -hmm. it's also very, it's less expensive for um, students, especially Japanese students wanting to study in an yeah. English environment in Belgium. Um, but I always tell them it's hard to um, to graduate. So it's you know it's maybe easy to mm -hmm. get in. It's open admission, but it's harder to graduate. You do have to study and and, and get decent yeah. grades before you graduate. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. of course, exchange students are a bit different <clears throat> story as they have uh, you know they don't maybe don't need the credits all not all of them. Um, yeah. So any other things you you actually like the most apart from free education, studying at Leuven University? Free education. Leuven has one of the best libraries in the world universities because you have so many faculty has its own big libraries and they were all in walking distance. So if you study in Paris, you study in Rome, you have amazing libraries, but you'll take forever to get to from one place to another, easily like hour and a half from one library to another. Well, it's in K you live and you just walk from one to another. Um, so in terms of research, I think, that was one of the best places to do research. Um, yeah. I mean, the living expenses is kind of expensive now, but it's not like as bad as some other parts of Brussels uh, because things in Brussels are becoming even more expensive right now. 
Um, so those are the things that will pop up in my mind. And also, this is another thing about Leuven is that like that it has a high concentration of international residents, but all of them usually have a bachelor's or master's of all. So you you kind of live in, in this like the utopia of all the incoming internationals, expats, or highly educated, which doesn't happen in other big cities where incoming immigrations and all these social issues that are evolved around, um, you know, um, integrations and all these um, uh, social assistance right, for the incoming mm -hmm. expats. It live and it feels like completely secluded from all these problems. Um, so, you know, if you this is the first time you ever study abroad to Europe and you don't really know where to go and you're very uncomfortable about, especially if you're Japanese, you're told that outside of Japan, it's not safe, right? <laughs> so if you if you have that mentality, I think living will be a great place to start. Like just get here, acquaint yourself to the European, um, you know, the lifestyle, and then gradually you start uh, to the other parts, yeah. That's indeed a good point. Like, like you said, it's it's so close to Brussels in a way, but it's totally different. It, it's a city, completely it's a different. City, city yeah. city, but um, and then of course yeah. with the university. Well, when I was studying there, we only had, I think at the time, the Kortrijk campus as well. But now looking at it, they have so many in different places, other campuses all over the country. Yeah. Right. And um, but of course, to me, I think to all of us, the alumni, it's still that you know, live and it is probably the main for us and, and the place we go to mm -hmm. as well. I think in my case, that's where I made the best friends that are still now in either in Japan or in Belgium, and there's this amazing connection with the with these students. Well, alumni, I have to mm -hmm. say right now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah. in what way? Did your studies at Kari Leuven influence your career or your, your choices you have made in your career? In what way? What, what do you mean? The, why I, I chose Kari Leuven? No, how they influenced maybe like your career choices afterwards. Like, you know, you went to China to, to work there. I don't know if that oh, yeah, yeah. You know, influenced okay. Kari Leuven maybe. I don't know. It's, it's a huge place. So it, it doesn't have a kind of voice that you might actually expect from other smaller liberal arts universities in the United States or um, maybe it's similar to Chuo University in that regard. It's, it's a big university. So it depends on which group you belong to. I, I, th I think that's one of the things. So KU live in, as a KU live in, it would never tell you, oh, you should do this and that. It's, 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 it's not like that, um, I feel. But it was the group of people that I work with their voices carry much more weight um, in, in a future choice making. Um, but how should I say it? it's 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 one of the leading research universities. And you know, just to give you a figure, I think the philosophy department when I was a PhD student, they had 35 professors, full-time faculties, and then 120 PhD students. And we don't even know how many postdocs are swarming around in that nest. <laughs> then you have master's students, MPhil masters, and then bachelor's students. So at that time, you stopped counting how many people are there. And all of them were hardworking, which is, a, which is incredible. I think one of the things about KU Leuven is that when you teach KU Leuven one course, you can tell that they're really, really hard work workers. So other university you go, you, you feel like, oh, okay, I need to slow down a bit. Um, you know, when I taught other different universities, like top students are usually the same. Like the top student from KU Leuven or top student from one of the state universities in Nebraska, it's, it's the same because you're only 18, 19 years old. You can't be that different. But I felt KU Leuven was like the average student's hardworking ratio and the percentage of the great students are pretty high. Um, so that definitely made me sort of aspire to become a researcher, uh, do well. Um, so like when I have a choice between small universities with higher pay and a big university with a research fund and moderate um, salary, I'll probably pick research like a KU Leuven styles of uh, university, but the, um, 
yeah, everything was going for really well. It's it's very rich university. Libraries are really amazing, and everybody's working on everything. Um, and I also, I'm I was older when I started at K Leuven, so I enjoy that sort of autonomy. Um, you don't have a supervisor, you have a promoter, which is like if you speak English, you come in and you meet your supervisor, and they call themselves promoter. Suddenly, your brain goes like, what? What does this mean? But it really means that, okay, you are on your own, we are colleagues, I'm not going to supervise you like supervisors. And I think that's something that I enjoy so much that I sort of like took as a role. Like when I instruct students to say, look, I'm going to supervise to some extent and tell you what not to do, but you need to have your own autonomy, um, you know, do your research that you think it's valuable. Um, instead of like assigning students or you know postdoc student graduate students under your research and just control them, um, I think that's the one of the characteristics that I learned from Caleb. Yeah, that's good to know as well. Like I said, for in my position right now, it's just a part time also for Caleb, but it's 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 for me. It's like I only spent one year in Japan at the university. So it's sometimes hard to explain how different the, the class yeah. the teaching is. So it's good to know, to hear from other people. Um, yeah. Are you currently teaching at the philosophy department and the Japanology, Japanese studies, both? So usually you don't have a philosophy department that teaches uh, Japanese philosophy. Um, you only teach European philosophy in the philosophy department. Uh, in European universities, okay. <laughs> but you know, recently, there re a lot of philosophy departments realized that this is a problem because like, if you go to history department, you can't just teach European history and say it's the world history, right? So I think there's a shift within the philosophy department. They started to culturally diverse, uh, diversify their curriculum, uh, not everywhere, but some places. So from my University of Edinburgh position is philosophy department and they asked me to teach Japanese philosophy so it's it's, it's kind of uh, progressive and revolutionary in a way so they want to study Chinese Korean Japanese philosophy as a part of philosophy department uh, at the KU Leuven I did a comparative philosophy so it's it's not only Japanese but also European and Japanese and again my supervisor was very progressive um, he said I don't I know nothing about Japanese philosophy but I want to know something about it. So why don't you just like specialize in that and tell me more about the specific topic from Japanese philosophy. And that's how things started. So kind of innovative, like open to anything. If you can convince your promoter that this is a great idea, even if he doesn't have specialization, they could pull specialists from outside to K-11, you know, because K-11 is, reputable world universities. So if you say, hey, we want to invite you from small university in Japan to come co-supervise or even in a jury for the dissertation on Japanese philosophy, um, you know, we are in a position to be able to promote. Uh, but like, because Japanese philosophy has to study the history, intellectual history of Japan, um, I also work in Japanese studies in that regard. Um, just to say, okay, in a historical background, what do they talk about and why is this important in Japanese cultural context? And then from that, in philosophy department, look at the arguments and say, is it adding something to the problems that we're facing in, in the philosophy department? You know. Yeah, I think maybe in the, in the next future step, as well as online, we should go into that. I think this Japanese philosophy, it's, it, to me, it's very interesting, but... Um, I think we have to we have to discuss amongst ourselves what you know to what public we can we can uh, of course sure. anytime I've been yeah I, I I've been in a position to be able to uh, do it from this so, August onwards so anytime. I think with the, via the Belgium Japan Association I saw some uh, videos coming coming uh, by in in uh, a while ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so how did you end up working for Jetro? I don't, I don't know what you're exactly doing for Jetro and, and, um, mm -hmm. that's a totally different job, I think. Yeah. So th th I didn't think it was 
to some extent, you know, when you're in academia, when you step outside of academia, you think it's a completely different world. And when you're students, you do think that, but I think once you enter the phase of researching, um, it's just a different topic, but it's the same, same skills, uh, same tools. Um, you know, sometimes in a real non-academic world, Excel sheet is a little bit more complicated than an academic Excel sheet. All right, the Japanese bureaucracy has layers that you would never imagine that exist. Um, so my specialization is, uh, I work for a boss that specializes in livestock farming. Um, so EU livestock farming. So I'm reading all the materials about the European farming and then just learning the farming terminologies in Japanese. Mm -hmm. And I'm the research assistant for him. Um, which is very interesting because all the discussions about sustainability, environmental protections, how we should actually make these green deals are highly philosophical. And the politicians are working with assumptions that are good sometimes and sometimes mostly like questionable assumptions, uh, but you know, work in progress for definition of what counts as sustainable, what counts as environmental, what counts as organic. You know, we said we, we say bio, what counts as organic food uh, is taking place. So to some extent, I think Jetaro experience gave me this idea of, because it's academic market, as you know, is just like, there's no world demand for philosophy, right? Like they, it's just limited seats. You have 120 PhD students. There's only 35 full-time faculty members. So maybe one out of 120, would get part-time if you're lucky, right? So I have to start thinking about, okay, if I teach students to become philosophers, what can I tell them about the job in the future? What's, you know, what, what's their life? I think Jethro gave me some good idea of, okay, you can use your research skills and you do work uh, that is not going to be devastatingly boring. It's still intellectually stimulating and you're contributing to the society. So in some extent, Jethro was much closer to, because my position is also a research assistant. So I felt it was much closer. Now, selling sake bottles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, wow. I, I felt that was like way out there. It's like completely different. Uh, but because the sake is cultural product, you know, some of the bottles being made since like, 1400s, 1500s, names are the same for the last 500 years. You meet with these like uh, Kuramoto, the breweries, brew brewers that are like 14th, 15th generation. Um, like you need to know history, like you need to know geography, you need to know cultural history of that land. Um, you need to know kanji to the extent where like, I didn't know you can read that kanji that way. <laughs> If you look at the sake bottles and also the distinctions and history behind sake, um, you know, I didn't know anything about it. So recently I gave a talk for Japan Foundation Mexico, actually. They get, asked me to give a one hour talk on um, Japanese sake and culture. So I went through the history of mythology and how the sake shows up in Japanese literature. Um, so the, the world of sake is almost as complex as the world of wine, uh, actually. And if you think about wine, it's very culturally important products where you can think about so many things you can do with that, right? Rather than just drinking it. Um, and I think it's the same with the sake, but the sake industry hasn't been promoting uh, well enough to be able to carry that message across so in that regard, like my position is cultural advisor. So like when they do the business communication between distributors here in Belgium and uh, producers in Japan, they have a completely different set of language and working understanding of even bottles. Uh, so I come in between and communicate uh, between them. Um, so it has been intellectually challenging in that regard. So. Yeah, I think once you kind of get rid of this assumption, like you could do whatever you want and you can still um, remain philosophical or literally or whatever your uh, background is in Japanese studies. 
Well, I think personally, of course, I think all the girls are nodding when we were when you're talking. So uh, it is indeed true. It's the same as you know studying Japanese. What you gonna do with that if you you know if you graduate or? Mm. And it's true. Like I think for me personally, I think for many other people as well, your first job is so important where you learn way more. Of course, it's just not the language, no. the culture, the ethics of work ethics, etc. But right. um, like in your case, it's amazing how you feel that, you know, that working for Jetro is very similar to, to uh, your research position at KU Leuven. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, how is Sake perceived? I don't know, maybe not like you say Benelux, not only Belgium, but um, I don't know, as you know, Belgium is a country of beer, <laughs> you know, I think gin has yeah. been trending for the last couple of years as well. Um, I don't know. I think next time you come, come back to Belgium <laughs> uh, for visiting your family, you'll be surprised to see the differences um, because Belgium in some extent conservative, but also very open to new ideas in a way that are surprising to Japanese. Um, so an example, um, my, my team has been very active on this and it's actually, I haven't seen many of them doing it in the rest of the Europe, but this team is specializing in promoting Japanese sake in relation to European cuisine. Mm -hmm. So most of the sake import and distributors just talk to the Japanese restaurants and Asian restaurants and push them bottles. Like, this is authentic Japanese sake. Uh, but my team has been working on talking to Michelin star restaurants, uh, you know, the top Horika uh, industries. And Michelin, like a three star Michelin restaurants do carry Japanese sake right now. Um, so, one of the really interesting thing about the higher end in Horeca industry is that when the chef spends so much time creating this dish, they bring wine. And if you can read Japanese, you should definitely read the uh, Oishinbo. Um, <laughs> Oishinbo has like a few episodes on Nihonshu. Fantastic. Um, it's basically like wine has really distinct characteristics. It's very like when you drink it, you know it's wine and then each glasses, each bottle has its very distinct characteristics to the point. When you go to the Michelin star restaurants, you expect that the really good wine comes out. Um, I have to break it to you, but it's not. Because <laughs> if you bring too much of a good wine, it actually impedes the dish that you're making. Mm -hmm. So like you, you, your dish kind of loses the fight against the wine. So you have to choose the wine that is acceptable, but not domineering. Uh, now, Japanese sake in the history of Japan always considered to be like vague, like boya, boyato shitaji. You know, it's like the, the taste that is like, it's good, but it's not that great. Like, it's just like, I don't know what to do with this. So even the top Japanese sake has a very, really flagrant, very tasty, but it has a tendency to kind of fade out. Um, so a lot of restaurants come in and say, look, we have to do a six course menu. Um, you know, then um, you have to provide better wine every time, six times. But if you put Japanese wine in between, you can actually cancel the palate. Mm. So third bottle, third glass is a Japanese sake, and then fourth, you start with wine again. Or there's extreme case where there's a really, really good restaurant in Anto called the Dim Dining. Um, they are like Yapano Log, so they love Japan. So like the whole theme is like omakase and Japanese theme. And they have this sake somewhere, probably the best in the region. He does 12 course menu with different sake every time. And this is a place where you take people like, oh, I don't like sake, like I, I hate it. Like, I don't wanna try it. I don't like this rice taste. And then you take that person there and come back as like a biggest fan of Japanese sake. Uh, because this guy knows how to actually present. So surprisingly, maybe more and more like wine sellers, um, a lot of European uh, restaurants in, in, in Benelux region started to uh, incorporate Japanese sake um, in the ways that Japanese breweries didn't really think about because they've they never seen Stoflace in their life. <laughs> you know, like if you... So there's a sake sommelier in Europe trying to say, okay, here's a stove place. People eat this all the time. What can we bring 
the pair as well with the uh, store fleas. Yeah, so it's surprising. Like I've, I've never expected that would happen, but uh, Michelin store restaurants, like they don't have any, you know, they don't know that there's Atsukan. They don't know that there's different temperature. They don't know Junmai, Ginjo differences. They just come in and so let me taste the liquid. And so this is really good. We should use it for our menu. Yeah. Wow, it's another another world, another deep world. Let's say yeah. now we have an address to go and have a nice dinner in Antwerp. That's always good to know. Yeah. Let's well, see. let me know. Like I'll yes. I'll remind you of the best Whenever place we to. Can, uh, we can fly back to Belgium. That's true. <laughs> shortcut, yeah. shortcut. Of course, we have to worry okay. about that. Yeah. Um, and also, like you guys live in Japan, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, we yeah. have access to infinite amount of. Uh, all different psychics. Yeah. That's true, but it's mostly with, but like you said, with, with, with Japanese food. I do went to one place, I think, in Hiro, also Michelin star uh, restaurant here, that they had a, yeah. in, a different courses with every course um, wine, and there was also sake in, in that, which mm -hmm. I thought was a, was a great idea. And like you said, it's a palate canceling. So it was, I was surprised, like, oh, you know, yeah. it's a French restaurant, but we had sake. So, mm -hmm. all right. To, uh, I think, almost finish, we have one question from Saskia. So what other projects outside academia are you hoping to do in the near future? <laughs> so last year, we had this first um, Brussels Japanese Film Festival, or Japanese Film Festival Brussels. Last year, the first one. Uh, Ghent has been doing Japan Square for several years now, I think. Um, I don't think Antwerp has any. But this, this Brussels one, um, Last year they did it. And the first year is always difficult because you never done it. So you don't really have a sponsor to talk to. You know, they don't have any numbers. Like they, they just look at the pamphlet and it says, there's no videos of previous events. So the first year, I think the organizer actually cracked their own pocket and made this 10 day Japan Film Festival and 500 people show up. So that's a, that's a, quite a good success for the first year. So next year, they're gonna to try to do the five year, uh, sorry, the five days, the same number of people. So like 100 person a day for five days. Um, so they actually invited me to become a part of the organizing team. And the University of Edinburgh, the, the position has a mandate for like a researcher, for, like there's a mandate for administration and cultural cultural services, community services mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, as a part of it, you have to actually show what you're studying is serving the good of the community. And I think that's what I'm going to do to kind of promote Japanese film. Um, so I've been working with, um, um, you don't know, I don't know if you know this, it's called the New Books Network. Uh, it, it's a podcast. Japanese studies channel. I'm a, I'm one of the many hosts hosts in, in, in this channel. Uh, basically, we interview people that wrote a books on Japanese culture, Japanese studies, and we just talk with them for one hour and put on a radio. Um, it, it, it's an it's incredible amount of access, like millions of people access this website every day, or something like that. But I interview like three specialists of films. Um, like one was a specialist of Ozu and the other one was a specialist of um, um, Koreda, Koreda movies, uh, you know, like father, like Soshite Chichi Naru and Manbik Kazoku. So we are thinking about maybe doing this film festivals and then like organize some event on Japanese film uh, and then maybe write a book together. So it's a semi-academic, semi-hobby uh, kind of thing. And, you know, so that's that's the outside um, academic, academia, yeah. Oh, yeah, indeed, interesting. I know that, I think that the Ghent Festival is on now or it was recently? It's on until, yeah, it, it's, I think it's happening right now. Yeah. A friend yeah. of mine. So, you know, I know all this phase, we know we have the alumni, we have the Japanology, so everybody shares information. So we're always happy to share whatever you're you're doing back back in Belgium, of course. We Fantastic. have work. and as we know, as of this morning, well, this morning here in Japan was uh, Drive My Car has just won the foreign the yeah. awesome foreign uh, I watched it last week, two weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The the I the how do you say? I haven't seen it yet. 
because uh, are you okay? I'll, I'll, I'll. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard a lot of different uh, <laughs> feedback from like people in the state yeah, yeah, yeah. and in Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I'm gonna go with the open mind. I actually uh, Nishimura-san yeah. is it Nishimura-san the guy who's uh, he is an ex-boyfriend of a good friend of mine, which is quite interesting. So <laughs> wow, yeah. it's personally involved, yeah, which is perfect like... for the plot, actually. <laughs> right, which is perfect for the plot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, maybe oh, okay. like one thing that you have to be careful about that movie is that you have to eat something before you go in. All right. It's three hours. Ooh, like I, like it's it's quite long, and I it started at from six o'clock to nine in my in, in Belgium time, and last ten minutes, many people just said I, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> like I left. Uh, but it's like I, I that so for in, instance the Linda Ehrlich Ehrlich she's the specialist of Korea movies. And she wants to write a book on um, Yakusho Koji and like the famous Japanese actors. But she was really impressed with that movie. Um, and I was critical. Um, so we took the two different positions and said, here's the reasons why I think some of the things that happen in the movie uh, is, is tough to swallow for me. And then she said, yeah, I totally agree. But here's the brilliant points. And yeah, she kind of convinced me. I think it's it's a fun, it's a director is young, um, so I think there's still a future. But I I think it's worth watching. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy from that movie is that it's so long that I forgot that we are in a pandemic and also the Ukrainian invasion, like for about 30, 30 minutes. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's like a, it's great. It's it's just so stressful every day in Europe right now. Yeah. Watching a movie like that gives you a pause. It just oh. it just stops you from thinking about it. And it was it was a great experience. Yeah. Well, great. Well, mm -hmm. something for me to look forward to. I don't know if the others have seen it already. Yes or no? No, I see no. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we have. But hey, if you fly back home with that new route and it takes uh, four hours longer, you can watch the whole drive my car. Well, I'm planning to fly to Europe in June, so that might be on the to-do list on my plane because it's a long. I'm not going to Belgium. I'm going the other way, anyways. But um, other way, yeah. I can imagine it's yeah. uh, it's going to be a long flight. So that's actually maybe I should wait until June. <laughs> but then people will start talking about it here, so I need to be you know be aware of what's happening mm. in the movie. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to thank you so, so much. I think I have a lot of ideas that we can like still talk about later on maybe um, because like, yeah, the sake, it's so diff to me, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, sake, the JetPro job, you, of course, your academic research job as well and the connection with Leuven we have. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody else who wants to put in a word, Jill or Els or Saskia or mm -hmm. Okubo Sensei, feel free to... Uh, well, I, I think it's in order to, to say that I I think your your talk and your, your experiences have been really interesting to hear. I think they're they're a little bit out of the box and, and that's what I appreciate even more about it. And I don't know, maybe it's your philosophy mindset that enables you to think outside of the box in, in that way, but I I'd like to imagine that your your experiences at KU Leuven and other life experiences that led you there um, have have helped you shape uh, into that kind of uh, thinking and um, yeah. I, I I feel like I need to apply way more of that into my own life as well and I hope mm -hmm. others here yeah. um, but you know, I think I think sometimes like the information about Japan to Belgium are quite limited. It remains to stay within the Japanese studies, whilst the public interest in Japan is quite high. And I think a lot of Japanese people know Belgium through football, uh, but they don't really know what Belgium is and what Belgium can offer. So hopefully, we can actually do a little bit of both, like talking about Belgium. Um, so you know, like I'm actually persuading my boss. To send his daughter to KU Leuven <laughs> because it's cheaper to study here uh, in KU Leuven than go back to Japan, right? And and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Okubo, uh, Chiyo University, <laughs> and and also if you want to come back to the, to Japan for the study master's degree, 
you could always do that from K Leuven to master's degree in Japan. And, you know, sometimes we even talk about the Gyaku Union, you know, the reverse study abroad, like you are K Leuven students, but then you can study abroad in Japanese university. So um, I, I think in the future, there's going to be a little bit more fluid relationship between Japan and Belgium. And I hope to see that happening. I, I'm very glad to hear that because at your university right now, they very emphasize the Chinese student to go abroad, especially in the yeah. Belgium. Mm -hmm. it, it's nicely a circumstance for a Japanese student to be yeah. in, in, in the heart of the Europe. Right, yeah, yeah. Good absolutely. Them. Yeah. yeah, and it's very, uh, very good English speaking country and also the Flemish students in general, this is a positive thing because we started with a negative note, right? The positive thing is that they are really used to multilingual environment. So they always meet somewhere in between, okay, can you speak French? Can you speak English? Can you speak, um, you know, German? Or like, do you know somebody who can speak Spanish? Because a lot of students now studying Spanish in uh, Flanders, for instance. So you can feel this sort of like, okay, you don't speak perfect English. You don't speak perfect Dutch. It's okay. We're going to find a way uh, to communicate. So that's definitely something that I recommend to Japanese students. Yeah. I'd say that's a bigger plus than the, the monetary... <laughs> Components. Monetary <laughs> Monetary reasons, yeah. Let's go cultural before closing, yeah. Sorry, I was muted. I didn't... Thank you so much. The time is up. Thank for you. those who want to stay online, please stay online for a few more minutes and have a chat. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll get Thank back much. to you for later. Yeah, I like I'm accessible online, like Nelly probably knows yeah. already. Um, so will, contact me anytime if you have any questions. We will plan just better. Follow you on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. We will plan better Thank next you. time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye.